Dr. Eleanor Foster sat alone in her dimly lit lab, her hands trembling as she stared at the sleek, metallic clock on her desk. It was unlike any clock anyone had ever seen. It didn't track hours or minutes. No, this one measured something far more terrifying. The clock's glowing face was blank for now, but Eleanor knew that once activated, it would predict the exact moment of a person's death. She had tested it on lab mice, then on plants, and finally on herself. But this wasn't just some macabre experiment. She had noble intentions, or so she believed. Eleanor had lost her husband, David, to a sudden heart attack five years ago. If she had known when his death would come, she could have done something, anything, to prevent it. This invention was meant to give people a second chance, the ability to plan, to prepare, and to survive. But something about the clock disturbed her, a sense of something watching. Every time she looked at it, she felt a cold weight pressing on her chest, as though the clock was more than a machine. It was aware. With trembling fingers, Eleanor entered the code that would activate the clock's predictive mechanism. The screen blinked and then flickered to life. She inhaled sharply, watching as her death date began to materialize. Four days, 23 hours, 16 minutes. Her heart raced. The blood drained from her face. No, this can't be right, she whispered, gripping the edge of the desk. The room seemed to tilt around her as the ticking of the clock echoed louder in her ears, more pronounced than ever. Four days? That was impossible. She was healthy in the prime of her life. There had to be a mistake. She frantically recalculated the variables, convinced she had made an error in the code, but the numbers stubbornly confirmed her worst fear. She had less than five days to live. Panic set in, twisting her stomach into knots. She couldn't die, not yet. There was too much work to do, too much left unfinished. Desperation clawed at her mind. What if she could change the outcome? If the clock could predict death, then surely she could find a way to stop it. Her phone buzzed, snapping her out of her spiraling thoughts. It was Marcus, her research partner and closest confidant since David's passing. His text was short but sharp. We need to talk, urgent. Without thinking, she grabbed her coat and rushed to meet Marcus at the nearby coffee shop. The air was bitter cold, a stark contrast to the sweat trickling down her spine. The clock's prediction hung over her like a storm cloud. Every passing second felt heavier, as though time was slipping through her fingers. When she arrived, Marcus was already seated, his face pale. He had always been calm, level-headed, but tonight his eyes betrayed a deep fear. Eleanor, he began, his voice shaky. Something's not right. The clock. It's not just predicting. I think it's influencing. What are you talking about? She demanded, sitting across from him. Her pulse pounded in her ears. I've been running parallel experiments, and every subject whose time we measured died exactly as predicted. But here's the thing. Some of those deaths shouldn't have happened. Accidents. Freak events. It's like the clock knows more than it should, like it's ensuring its predictions come true. Eleanor's breath caught in her throat. Could that really be possible? Was her own death now inevitable? No. She refused to believe it. I have four days, Marcus, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. His eyes widened in shock. What? Four days? I can't explain it, but I'm going to change this. There has to be a way. Marcus nodded, but Eleanor could see the doubt in his eyes. They talked for hours, brainstorming every possibility, everything from altering her environment to running further tests on the clock itself. But as the night wore on, exhaustion overtook them both. Eleanor returned to her lab, her mind buzzing with fear and ideas. She could feel the seconds slipping away, the pressure building. She had always been in control, always able to, to manipulate variables, to create solutions. But now, for the first time, she was trapped in a problem she couldn't solve. As she entered the lab, she froze. The clock, which had been idle on her desk, was now softly ticking. The ticking was rhythmic, methodical, like a heartbeat. But Eleanor hadn't set it to run. It was impossible. She approached cautiously, her skin prickling with a deep sense of dread. The screen, once displaying her death countdown, had changed. Now it flashed one word over and over again, run. Her breath hitched. She stumbled back, eyes wide, mind racing. It had to be a glitch, a malfunction, a product of her exhausted brain. But deep down, she knew. The clock wasn't just a machine anymore. It was alive, and it was coming for her. Eleanor's pulse quickened, her heart hammering in her chest as the word run blinked ominously on the clock's display. The lab suddenly felt smaller, its shadows longer and darker than before.
The quiet hum of the machines around her seemed louder, more sinister, as if everything in the room was watching her, waiting for her next move. She turned away from the clock and stumbled to her desk, gripping the edges as she struggled to gather her thoughts. This wasn't possible. The clock was just a tool, an invention, a machine meant to predict, not to control or manipulate. But the message flashing on its screen made her doubt everything she had built. Her phone buzzed again and she jumped, her nerves on edge. It was Marcus. You okay? I've been thinking, meet me at the lab. We need to figure this out. Eleanor hesitated, her mind racing. Should she tell Marcus about the clock's message? Would he even believe her? And worse, would he think she was losing it? She could barely believe it herself. But she couldn't ignore the creeping dread that had settled in her gut. Something was wrong, something far beyond her control. She grabbed her phone, her fingers trembling as she typed back, I'm still here. Something's wrong with the clock. It sent a message, run. Marcus's response was almost immediate. Get out of there, Eleanor, now. I'm on my way. She swallowed hard, her throat tight. Her eyes darted back to the clock. It was still ticking, its sound growing louder in her ears, filling the room with a relentless, pounding rhythm. But it wasn't the ticking that unnerved her. It was the feeling that something was lurking just beyond the edge of her awareness, like she was being watched, hunted. Without thinking, she grabbed her bag and darted out of the lab, the cold night air hitting her like a slap. Her breath came in short gasps as she hurried toward her car. She fumbled with her keys, her hands shaking so badly she could barely get the door unlocked. Finally, she slid into the driver's seat and slammed the door shut, locking it. She glanced back at the building. The lab loomed in the darkness, its windows gleaming under the dim street lights. For the first time, it felt like a prison, a place that had trapped her in a nightmare of her own making. Her phone buzzed again. Marcus, on my way, don't move. She gripped the steering wheel tightly, her knuckles white. The clock's message kept flashing in her mind. Run. Why? What was coming? She didn't know, but the primal fear coursing through her veins made her feel like she was already too late. Minutes passed in agonizing silence as she waited for Marcus. Every creak of a tree branch or rustle of wind set her heart racing. She tried to calm herself, rationalize it, but the terror was overwhelming. And then, through the windshield, she saw it. The clock. It was sitting on the dashboard, though she hadn't brought it with her. She gasped, her body freezing in place as she stared at it in disbelief. She knew she had left it back in the lab. There was no way it could have followed her. The digital numbers blinked and shifted, the countdown still ticking away. But it wasn't the time remaining on her life that scared her. It was the message flashing on the screen once more. Run. Her scream caught in her throat, her chest tightening with sheer panic. She yanked open the car door, stumbling out into the cold night, her eyes wide with terror. The street was eerily empty, the shadows lengthening as if reaching for her. She ran. Her mind didn't know where she was going, but her legs moved of their own accord, desperate to escape the inexplicable nightmare that had consumed her life. Her breath came in ragged gasps as she tore down the deserted street, her footsteps echoing in the stillness. Behind her, she could hear the ticking, faint at first, but growing louder with each passing second. The same rhythmic ticking of the death clock, only this time it seemed to be following her. No, not following her. Chasing her. She glanced back, her heart lurching in her chest as she saw something moving in the shadows. A figure, no, a presence, gliding after her. She couldn't make out its shape, but it was there. An indistinct form of darkness that seemed to pulse with the ticking sound. Faster. She had to run faster. Her legs burned with exertion her lungs screaming for air, but she pushed on, driven by pure fear. She could feel it now, the presence closing in on her, the ticking growing louder and faster, as though time itself was speeding up. Suddenly, headlights appeared in the distance. A car. Marcus. Eleanor's hope surged, her feet pounding the pavement as she sprinted toward the approaching car. The presence behind her was so close now, she could feel the cold breath of death on the back of her neck. She was almost there, almost safe. The car screeched to a halt and Marcus jumped out, his face a mask of worry. Eleanor, get in! Without thinking, she dove into the passenger seat, slamming the door shut just as the ticking reached a fever pitch. The presence, whatever it was, seemed to stop, lingering at the edge of the headlights, its shape flickering like a shadow in the wind.
Marcus sped off, his eyes darting between her and the road. What the hell happened? The clock, Eleanor gasped, clutching her chest, trying to catch her breath. It's alive. It, it followed me. It was chasing me, Marcus. He frowned, glancing at her in disbelief. What do you mean? Chasing you? It's just a machine. No, she whispered, her voice trembling. It's more than that. It's, it's sentient. It knows. It wants to make sure its predictions come true. Marcus tightened his grip on the steering wheel, his knuckles white. We need to destroy it. If it's doing this, we can't let it exist. Eleanor nodded, her mind racing. But deep down, a sickening thought gnawed at her. What if it couldn't be destroyed? What if the clock had already decided her fate and there was nothing she could do to stop it? The clock had warned her to run, but where could she run when time itself was the enemy? The clock's ticking haunted Eleanor's thoughts, even as Marcus drove them through the dark, empty streets. The sound echoed in her mind, a relentless rhythm she couldn't shake. She sat in the passenger seat, staring out the window, her eyes flicking nervously to every shadow that passed. Marcus was silent beside her, his face tense with determination. They arrived at Marcus's apartment in the city, its looming shape barely visible in the faint glow of the streetlights. The place was familiar and comforting, but tonight it felt oppressive. Every corner, every darkened hallway seemed to hum with the presence of the clock, even though it was miles away, or so she thought. Are you sure it didn't follow us? Eleanor whispered as Marcus unlocked the door. He shot her a glance, trying to hide his own fear. I don't know, but we're not taking any chances. We'll figure this out. Inside, Marcus's apartment was cluttered with papers, books, and diagrams, mostly from their research. The sight of it, once a source of pride, now filled Eleanor with dread. What had they unleashed? What had she created? Marcus turned on the lights, his movements sharp and urgent. He pulled out his laptop and set it on the kitchen table. We need to go over the clock's code again, see if there's something we missed, some glitch or anomaly. Eleanor nodded, though a gnawing doubt lingered in the back of her mind. This wasn't just a code problem. The clock was no longer a simple invention. It had become something else, something alive, something malevolent. She took a seat across from Marcus, her hands still shaking. He started typing, pulling up the blueprints and algorithms they had written for the clock. As the screen filled with lines of code, Eleanor's mind wandered, replaying the events of the night. The chase. The ticking. The presence that had followed her, hunting her through the streets. Her phone buzzed, pulling her out of her thoughts. She picked it up, her heart skipping a beat. A new message flashed on the screen. You cannot run. Her blood turned to ice. The words stared back at her, mocking her attempt to escape. She dropped the phone, her breath coming in short gasps. What is it? Marcus asked, looking up from the computer, concern etched on his face. She couldn't find her voice. Instead, she handed him the phone, her hands trembling. His eyes widened as he read the message, his face going pale. This is... This is impossible, he muttered. How could it? A sudden crash interrupted him, the sound of shattering glass echoing through the apartment. They both jumped to their feet, eyes wide with panic. The living room window had exploded inward, shards of glass scattered across the floor. And there, in the center of the chaos, stood the clock. It wasn't just any clock. It was the clock. The sleek, metallic device sat unnaturally on the floor, its screen glowing with that same sickening blue light. The ticking was deafening now, reverberating through the walls, through Eleanor's skull, like a heartbeat in time with her fear. The screen blinked to life, the countdown showing again. Three days, five hours, 20 minutes. Marcus took a step back, his face a mask of disbelief. How, how did it get here? Eleanor shook her head, her mouth dry. I don't know. It was supposed to be at the lab. It shouldn't be here. But the clock was here, and it had come on its own. Marcus grabbed a metal wrench from the kitchen drawer, his jaw set in grim determination. We're ending this now. No, wait. Eleanor started, but it, it was too late. Marcus rushed forward, swinging the wrench down toward the clock with all his strength. The metal made contact with a sickening thud, but instead of shattering, the clock absorbed the blows, but as the wrench ricocheting off with a loud clang. Marcus stumbled back, his face twisted in shock. The clock was unharmed, the ticking never faltering. If anything, the sound grew louder, more insistent, filling the apartment with its unyielding presence. The screen flickered again, and a new message appeared. You cannot change fate.
Eleanor's knees buckled and she sank to the floor, her heart pounding in her chest. This wasn't just a machine, it was something far worse. Something unstoppable. Marcus stood frozen, his eyes wide with terror. We need to get out of here, he whispered, backing away from the clock. Now! But as they turned toward the door, it slammed shut with a force that rattled the walls. The lights flickered, casting long, eerie shadows across the room. The temperature plummeted, a bone-chilling cold seeping into the air. Eleanor's breath came out in clouds, her body trembling uncontrollably. She could feel it now, the presence, the thing that had been hunting her. It was here, inside the apartment, and it wasn't going to let them leave. What is happening? Marcus whispered, his voice barely audible over the ticking. Eleanor shook her head, tears welling in her eyes. I don't know. It's like the clock. It's controlling everything. Suddenly, the screen on the clock blinked again, and the ticking slowed. The message changed. Time is mine. Before either of them could react, the air in the room seemed to shift, thickening, pressing down on them like a physical force. Eleanor gasped for breath, her lungs straining against the invisible weight. Marcus stumbled forward, clutching his chest, his face contorted in pain. Eleanor tried to move to reach out for Marcus, but her body felt heavy, sluggish. She could feel the clock's influence seeping into her mind, twisting her thoughts, warping her perception of time. The seconds dragged on endlessly, stretching into an eternity, while her body remained frozen, trapped in place. Marcus collapsed to the floor, gasping for air, his fingers clawing at his throat. Eleanor's vision blurred, her consciousness slipping away as the ticking of the clock filled her ears. She was losing. Time was winning. And then, in the darkness of her fading mind, a final thought pierced through the terror. The clock didn't just predict death. The oppressive weight of the ticking clock bore down on Eleanor as she lay paralyzed on the floor, her vision swimming in and out of focus. Time seemed to stretch, bend, and twist in impossible ways around her. Every breath was a struggle, each second drawn out into an agonizing eternity. Beside her, Marcus gasped for air, his hands clutching his chest, his face contorted in sheer panic. Eleanor fought to keep herself conscious, her thoughts a chaotic mess. She had created this. The clock wasn't just predicting death, it was orchestrating it, weaving the fabric of time itself to control the end of life. And now it was her turn. Through the fog of her fading mind, she heard the clock's steady, rhythmic ticking grow louder, drowning out every other sound. The apartment around them seemed to dissolve into a swirling haze of darkness, shadows flickering and twisting as though reality itself were breaking apart. The screen on the clock blinked once more, displaying a new message. Surrender to time. No, Eleanor muttered weakly, her voice barely a whisper. She tried to move, but her body wouldn't respond. She could feel the clock's presence inside her now, a cold, invasive force burrowing into her mind, her very essence. The countdown was relentless, ticking closer and closer to her final moment. Suddenly, Marcus's voice broke through the haze. Eleanor! His voice was strained, desperate, but it was enough to jolt her back to the present. She turned her head slightly, her eyes locking onto his. He was still alive, barely. His face was pale, his breathing shallow, but his eyes were wide with determination. We have to. Stop it, he gasped, his voice raspy. We can't let it win. Eleanor nodded weakly, her mind racing. She had to fight. She couldn't just let the clock take her life when I take Marcus's life. But how? The clock was controlling time itself, manipulating reality around them. How could they fight something so powerful, so inescapable? Then a thought flickered in her mind, something Marcus had said earlier. We need to destroy it. They had tried to physically break the clock, and it had withstood the blow. But what if there was another way? What if, instead of trying to destroy the clock, they could disrupt the very thing it was built to control? Time. Summoning every ounce of strength she had left, Eleanor forced herself to move. Her muscles screamed in protest, her limbs heavy and sluggish, but she pushed through the pain. Slowly, she crawled across the floor toward Marcus, who was still struggling to breathe. We, we need to overload it, Eleanor rasped, her voice hoarse. We need to disrupt the flow of time. Marcus blinked, barely able to focus on her words. How? He managed to choke out. Eleanor's mind raced, her thoughts frantic. The clock, it's linked to the algorithm. It uses time as its power source. If we can overload the system, feed it more time than it can handle, it might break. We have to make it lose control. Marcus nodded weakly, understanding flickering in his eyes. How do we do that? 
Eleanor crawled over to the kitchen table, her hands fumbling for her laptop. Her fingers were shaking so badly she could barely type, but she managed to open the clock's control system, pulling up the core algorithm that powered its predictive capabilities. The countdown to her death was still displayed on the screen, three days, five hours, and a few precious minutes. We're going to flood it, Eleanor said, her voice shaky. I'm going to input false data, more time than it can process. If I feed it an endless loop of time, it might destabilize the system. Marcus nodded, his breaths shallow but steady. Do it. Eleanor's hands flew across the keyboard, entering line after line of code, trying to bypass the clock's restrictions. Her vision blurred, the room spinning around her as the ticking grew louder and louder, but she couldn't stop now. This was their only chance. She input the final command, a loop that would feed the clock an infinite stream of time, overwhelming its ability to control the flow of death. Her fingers hovered over the enter key for just a moment, a surge of fear gripping her. What if this didn't work? What if she was wrong and the clock would retaliate, sealing their fates even faster? But there was no other option. With a trembling hand, she pressed the key. For a moment, nothing happened. The clock screen continued to flash its countdown, the ticking still loud and oppressive. Eleanor's heart sank. Had she failed? Was this it? Then suddenly the ticking faltered. It stuttered, hesitating, as though the clock itself were confused. The lights in the apartment flickered wildly, casting long shadows that twisted and writhed along the walls. The air grew thick, heavy, as though time itself was warping around them. The clock screen flickered, its countdown freezing in place. Three days, five hours, 16 minutes. Then the numbers began to spin wildly, flipping through days, hours, minutes, and seconds in rapid succession. The clock was no longer in control. It's working, Marcus gasped, his voice weak but hopeful. Eleanor stared at the spinning numbers, her breath catching in her throat. The clock's power was unraveling. Time was slipping out of its grasp, breaking free from the control it had exerted over them. But then the screen blinked one last time and a final message appeared. You cannot escape what is already written. Before Eleanor could react, the clock exploded in a burst of light and sound, sending shockwaves through the room. She was thrown back, her body slamming into the wall with a force that knocked the air from her lungs. Everything went dark. When she opened her eyes, she was lying on the floor, the room eerily quiet. The ticking was gone. The clock was gone. She sat up slowly, her body aching, and looked around. Marcus lay motionless on the other side of the room, his body limp. Marcus! Eleanor scrambled over to him, her heart pounding. She shook him gently, her hands trembling. Marcus, wake up, please! For a moment, there was nothing. Then his eyes fluttered open. He gasped for breath, his chest rising and falling in shallow but steady breaths. Eleanor exhaled, tears streaming down her face. We did it, she whispered, relief flooding through her. We stopped it. Marcus managed a weak smile. You stopped it. But even as she said the words, a cold realization crept into her mind. The clock was gone, but the countdown was still there, in her head, like a shadow she couldn't shake. Had she really escaped or had time already written her fate? Eleanor and Marcus sat in the quiet aftermath, the silence of the apartment now almost deafening. The explosion had left a mess of debris and shattered glass, but the ominous ticking of the clock was no longer present. The air was still, devoid of the sinister presence that had plagued them. Marcus was slowly regaining his strength, but he looked deeply unsettled. Eleanor, still grappling with the shock, couldn't shake the lingering feeling that something was still very wrong. Despite the apparent defeat of the clock, an unsettling thought gnawed at her. The clock's final message, you cannot escape what is already written, seemed to imply that the end had been preordained. Are you all right? Marcus asked, his voice hoarse as he sat up slowly, wincing at the pain. Eleanor nodded, though her face was ashen. I'm, I'm fine, just shaken. We need to clean up here and figure out what to do next. Marcus nodded in agreement, though his eyes were troubled. They worked in silence, gathering the remnants of their shattered lives. As Eleanor picked up the fragments of the broken clock, she couldn't help but notice a small, oddly shaped piece lying amidst the wreckage, a piece that didn't seem to fit with the rest of the clock's structure. Curiosity peaked, she picked it up. It was a small, ornate metal piece with intricate engravings, something that looked almost like a key. She turned it over in her hands, feeling a shiver run down her spine. The engraving seemed familiar, but she couldn't place it. Marcus, look at this, 
she said, holding up the piece. He glanced over, his brows furrowing in confusion. Where did that come from? I found it in the wreckage. It looks like it could be part of the clock, she said. Marcus took it from her, examining it closely. It's strange. This doesn't match any part of the clock we built. Eleanor took a deep breath, her mind racing. It could be a remnant of something more, something that wasn't part of our original design. As they continued cleaning, Eleanor couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled over her. The clock's influence had been terrifyingly potent, and the final message made her question if they had truly escaped its grasp. Later, as night fell, Marcus and Eleanor sat together, exhausted but restless. The apartment, though repaired, felt strangely hollow, as if the essence of the clock still lingered in the space. Eleanor glanced at the piece of metal again, her thoughts spiraling. Marcus, what if the clock wasn't just predicting our deaths, but controlling them? What if it had a deeper purpose? Marcus looked at her, his face pale. You mean like a final design? Something we couldn't see because we were too focused on its functionality? Exactly, Eleanor said, her voice trembling. What if the clock had a failsafe, a way to ensure its predictions came true, even if we destroyed it? Marcus's eyes widened in realization. You mean, it might have been designed to integrate into something else, something beyond our understanding? Eleanor nodded slowly. I think so. And if that's the case, then we need to find out what that something else is before it's too late. They spent the next few hours poring over their research and notes, trying to uncover any hidden details or overlooked aspects of the clock's design. The small metal piece they had found seemed to be the key to unlocking the clock's true nature. But as they studied it, the feeling of unease grew stronger. Eventually, Eleanor stumbled upon an old journal, one she had nearly forgotten. It was David's, her late husband's. She opened it, her heart sinking as she flipped through the pages. There were sketches and notes about the clock, but also something else, references to a deeper, more ancient concept of time, something almost supernatural. The final entry caught her eye, written in David's neat handwriting. Time is not just a measure of existence. It is a force, an entity with its own will. Our clock is merely a conduit, a means to understand and control this force. But remember, time cannot be controlled, only influenced. Be wary of its power, for it holds the fate of all who seek to master it. Eleanor's hands trembled as she read the entry. The implications were staggering. The clock had been designed to harness time's power, but it seemed that time itself was a force that couldn't be fully controlled or understood. Their attempts to outwit it had only scratched the surface. A sudden thought struck her. Marcus, what if the clock's final message was a warning? What if it's telling us that no matter what we do, time, its influence, will find a way to fulfill its purpose? Marcus looked at her, his eyes filled with understanding. You mean that we've only been pawns in a larger game? That time, as a force, will always find a way to balance itself, no matter what? Eleanor nodded solemnly. Exactly. We thought we had defeated it, but what if the real power of the clock was its ability to manipulate our perceptions and fears? What if its true purpose was to show us that time's influence is inevitable? A chilling silence followed, the weight of the realization sinking in. They had fought against the clock, tried to escape its grasp, but perhaps time itself had been, been the true antagonist all along. The final moments of the night were spent in quiet reflection, the oppressive atmosphere lifting slightly as they came to terms with their ordeal. The small metal piece, though seemingly insignificant, was a reminder of the clock's deeper, darker purpose. They had survived the immediate threat, but the implications of their experience left a lingering fear. As dawn approached, Eleanor and Marcus sat together, the first light of morning casting a hopeful glow on their weary faces. They had faced the darkness of time's manipulation, survived its chilling grasp, and come out on the other side. But the clock's final message echoed in their minds, a reminder of the inexorable force of time and the limitations of human control. Story number two. It started with the sound of water, a slow rhythmic drip coming from the bathroom, barely noticeable at first, but persistent enough to gnaw at the edges of Jack's consciousness. Jack was used to the silence of his apartment. Living alone had its perks, peace, quiet, and solitude. But over the last few nights, the quiet had been broken. Each night, as the hour crept past midnight, the faint sound of dripping water began. At first, Jack thought it was his imagination. He'd always been a light sleeper, and it wasn't unusual for small sounds to keep him awake. But the dripping continued, 
Lying in bed, he could hear it now, clear as day, coming from the bathroom. Drip, 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 he sighed, annoyed more than concerned, and swung his feet out from under the covers. Maybe he hadn't shut the faucet off all the way after brushing his teeth. Maybe there was a leak. Whatever it was, he'd fix it, and then he'd finally get some rest. The floor was cold beneath his feet as he padded to the bathroom. The door was slightly ajar, and when he pushed it open, the sound became more distinct. Drip, 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 drip. It was coming from the sink. He reached out, grasping the faucet with one hand and twisting it tightly. There, that should do it. Jack stood for a moment, listening. Silence. Satisfied, he returned to his bedroom and climbed back into bed, pulling the blanket over himself. But as soon as his head hit the pillow, the noise returned. Drip, drip, drip. Jack's pulse quickened. He sat up, frowning in the dark. How could that be? He had just turned off the faucet. Was there a leak in the pipes? The sound was maddening now, louder and more pronounced, as if it was echoing inside his head. He couldn't ignore it. This time, he grabbed a flashlight from his nightstand before heading back to the bathroom. He flicked it on as he pushed open the door, casting a beam of light over the sink. The faucet wasn't dripping. In fact, it was bone dry. His heart thudded against his ribs as he scanned the room. The sound was still there, but the source wasn't the sink. Slowly, he turned toward the shower. Drip, drip, drip. The sound was coming from the bathtub, but not from the faucet. No, it was coming from the wall behind it. Jack's breath caught in his throat. He leaned in closer, pressing his ear to the cool tiles. The dripping continued, steady and deliberate. It wasn't just water. Something about the noise was different now, heavier, thicker. What the hell? Jack muttered under his breath. He pulled back and examined the tiles. Everything seemed fine on the surface, but the sound was unmistakable. It wasn't coming from the pipes, it was coming from behind the wall. His skin prickled. A faint sense of unease crawled up his spine. He backed away from the bathtub, the flashlight shaking slightly in his hand. What could be causing the sound? He decided to ignore it for the night. Whatever it was, he'd deal with it in the morning. Jack switched off the flashlight and returned to bed, but sleep didn't come easy. The dripping continued, haunting him, seeping into his dreams. The next morning, he called the building's maintenance department. A man named Dave came by in the afternoon and Jack explained the situation, how the dripping noise was persistent but seemed to be, to be coming from behind the bathroom wall, not the faucet or pipes. Dave listened carefully and then smiled reassuringly. Don't worry, man. Old building like this, we get this all the time. It's probably just a small leak in the plumbing. I'll take a look and see what's going on. Jack followed Dave into the bathroom, watching as he tapped on the tiles and inspected the walls. He pulled out a small tool and began to pry one of the tiles loose. It popped off easily, revealing the drywall beneath. And that's when the smell hit them. A sickening metallic odor wafted out from behind the wall, causing Jack to gag. Dave took a step back, covering his mouth and nose with his sleeve. Jesus, Dave muttered. That's, that's not right. Jack felt a knot form in his stomach. The smell was overpowering now, and as Dave reached in to pull back more of the drywall, a horrible realization began to take shape in Jack's mind. Something was behind that wall. Dave hesitated for a moment, then yanked away a large section of the drywall. His eyes widened in horror, and he stumbled backward, dropping his tools. Jack moved closer, heart pounding, trying to see what had caused such a reaction. And then he saw it. Behind the wall, nestled among the pipes, was a human hand. It was shriveled and decayed, the flesh hanging loosely from the bones, fingers curled in a macabre grip. But worse than the sight of the hand was the fact that it was still wet. Drops of thick, dark liquid dripped from the fingers onto the floor. Drip, drip, drip. Jack's vision swam. He staggered back, his knees buckling beneath him. He could barely hear Dave shouting, calling for help. The world tilted, and before Jack knew it, everything went black. Jack woke up to the sound of hushed voices and the sharp scent of antiseptic. His head throbbed and it took a few moments for the room to come into focus. He was in a hospital bed, an IV drip attached to his arm. What? He mumbled, struggling to sit up. A nurse by his side noticed he was awake and quickly called for the doctor. Moments later, a man in a white coat entered the room, clipboard in hand. Mr. Collins, you had quite a shock, the doctor said in a calm voice. You passed out at your apartment. Maintenance called an ambulance, and we brought you here. Jack blinked, 
trying to piece together what had happened. Then, in a sudden rush, the memories came flooding back. The dripping, the smell, the hand behind the wall. His stomach turned, and he winced as the images flashed in his mind. The wall, Jack whispered. There was something behind the wall. The doctor gave him a sympathetic look. I understand you're very shaken. It's not every day people find something like that in their home. Something like that? Jack repeated, his voice trembling. It was a human hand. What happened to it? What did they find? The doctor sighed, glancing at the nurse before speaking. The police were called, Mr. Collins. They're investigating now, but from what I understand, the remains belong to a female. The body had been concealed behind the wall for, well, a very long time. Jack's mind raced. A body behind his bathroom wall? How long had it been there? How had no one noticed before? The thought sent a chill down his spine. And the sound, Jack muttered. The dripping. It wasn't water. It was something else. The doctor didn't reply at first, as if weighing how much to tell him. It appears, he said carefully, that there was some decomposition which led to the dripping you heard. Jack felt nauseous again. The idea that he had been living with something so horrific right behind the walls was almost too much to process. He took a deep breath, trying to keep calm. When can I leave? Jack asked. We'll keep you overnight for observation, the doctor replied. But you should be able to return home tomorrow, assuming everything looks good. Home. The word filled Jack with a sense of dread now. His apartment, once a place of solitude and safety, felt tainted, infected by the discovery. Still, he nodded, knowing he had little choice. He needed answers, and staying in the hospital wouldn't provide them. The next day, Jack was discharged and made his way back to his apartment. As soon as he stepped into the building, he noticed the police tape cordoning off his door. A uniformed officer stood nearby, and Jack approached cautiously. Excuse me, Jack said. I live here. Is it safe to go in? The officer gave him a nod. The scene's been cleared. You're free to enter, but we'll need to ask you some questions later. Jack thanked him and stepped inside. The apartment felt eerily quiet now, even more so than before. The bathroom door was ajar, and though he wanted to avoid it, he knew he had to see. He approached slowly, heart thudding in his chest, and peered inside. The tiles were cracked and removed, the wall torn open. The hand, along with the rest of the body, had been taken away, nah. but the space behind the wall remained exposed, a gaping hole filled with the mess of ancient pipes and crumbling plaster. Jack knelt down, staring into the void. The air was still heavy with the faint metallic scent, and he felt a wave of nausea wash over him. But something else caught his attention now. There was something behind the remaining drywall, something scratched into the surface. He reached out, his fingers tracing the jagged marks. It was faint but clear. A name. Eleanor. Jack recoiled. The name sent a jolt of recognition through him, though he couldn't quite place why. He stood, backing away from the hole, and then turned to leave the bathroom. But as he stepped into the hallway, a sudden, sharp sound echoed through the apartment. Drip. 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 Jack froze, his blood running cold. He whipped around, staring at the bathroom. The faucet was off, the pipes had been checked. There was no possible explanation for the noise. And yet it persisted. Drip. 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 The sound grew louder, more insistent. Jack felt a surge of panic, his mind racing. The dripping wasn't coming from the bathroom this time. It was echoing from deeper within the walls, moving through the apartment like a living thing. Jack bolted for the door, flinging it open and stumbling into the hallway. His breaths came in ragged gasps as he slammed the door shut behind him. He leaned against the wall like heart pounding, trying to make sense of it all. What was happening in his apartment? The body, the name scratched into the wall, and now the noise. It didn't make any sense. But one thing was clear. Whatever had been hidden behind that wall wasn't at rest. It wasn't over. The door to the neighboring apartment creaked open, and an old woman poked her head out. Mrs. Harrington, Jack remembered her name. She'd lived in the building for decades long before Jack moved in. Are you all right, dear? She asked in a shaky voice. You look pale as a ghost. Jack hesitated, unsure if he should burden the elderly woman with the horror he'd uncovered. But something about her eyes, something knowing, made him speak. There was a body, Jack said quietly, behind the wall in my bathroom. I don't understand how it got there, but I... Before he could finish, Mrs. Harrington's expression darkened. She stepped closer, her voice dropping to a whisper. They never told you about Eleanor, did they? Jack's blood ran cold. Eleanor? Mrs. Harrington nodded gravely. She lived here, in your apartment, years ago, and then one day, she vanished. Jack's mouth went dry. 
the name scratched behind the wall, the same name this woman was speaking. What? What happened to her? Jack asked, dread curling in his stomach. Mrs. Harrington's eyes gleamed with something between fear and sorrow. They never found her. Not until now. Jack stared at Mrs. Harrington, his mouth dry, his pulse racing. You mean Eleanor? The woman behind my wall? She lived here? Mrs. Harrington nodded slowly, her face grim. Yes, Eleanor Grant. She moved in decades ago. It was all so sudden when she vanished and no one knew what became of her. But those of us who lived here then, we had our suspicions. Suspicions? Jack asked, his voice trembling. Mrs. War. Harrington's eyes shifted toward his apartment door. Her lips pressed tightly together as if she were choosing her words carefully. Some people said she left, ran away from something, but others believed, well, they believed she never left at all. Not really. Jack's stomach twisted in knots. What do you mean? Mrs. Harrington leaned closer, her voice lowering to a whisper. There were rumors. People in the building heard strange things, saw shadows at odd hours. Eleanor was troubled, you see? She was a quiet girl, kept to herself, but there were whispers that she had a violent relationship with a man. No one ever saw him, but they heard the arguments, the crashes. Then one day, she was gone. Just like that. Jack's hands clenched into fists. He could feel the weight of her words sinking in, intertwining with the horror he had already experienced. So you think someone? I don't know what happened to her, Mrs. Harrington cut in. But I'll tell you this. After she disappeared, the apartment never felt right. People would hear things. Water dripping when there was no leak. Strange sounds in the walls. Some even said they saw her. Standing in the hallway late at night. Jack's heart pounded in his chest. The dripping, the noises. It had all started the moment he moved into the apartment. He wanted to say something, to tell her about the name scratched into the wall, but his throat was too tight. It was as if the weight of the truth was pressing down on him, suffocating him. And no one did anything? Jack asked finally, his voice barely above a whisper. Mrs. Harrington gave him a sorrowful look. No proof. No body. No one to accuse. The police searched the building when she disappeared, but they found nothing. After a while, people stopped asking questions. The apartment stayed empty for years after that. But you, she paused, looking Jack directly in the eyes, you brought it all back. Jack's skin prickled. What do you mean? The day you moved in, people started hearing the dripping again. It's as if Eleanor is trying to tell you something. She wants you to know what happened. Jack shuddered, stepping back. This was too much. He felt like he was standing on the edge of a terrible precipice, teetering on the brink of something dark and unknowable. Mrs. Harrington must have sensed his fear because she gave him a weak smile, though it didn't reach her eyes. Just be careful, dear. Sometimes it's better not to dig too deep. Some things should stay buried. Back in his apartment, Jack paced the floor, his thoughts racing. Eleanor's story gnawed at him, filling him with equal parts curiosity and dread. Mrs. Harrington's warning echoed in his mind. Some should stay buried. But how could he leave it alone? A body had been in his walls, hidden for God knows how long, and the name scratched behind the drywall was no coincidence. But what terrified him most was the thought that Eleanor wasn't done with him. She had been trying to reach out to make herself known. The dripping, the scratches, the sounds, none of it was random. She had been waiting for someone to uncover her secret. But what did she want from him? The thought was interrupted by another noise, a soft creaking like the sound of wood bending under weight. Jack stiffened, turning his head toward the bathroom. The door, which he had left wide open, was now slowly swinging shut. His breath hitched. There was no draft, no windows were open. Yet the door moved as if someone had pushed it. Uh, Jack swallowed hard and moved cautiously toward the bathroom. The air felt thick with something unseen, and the closer he got, the more oppressive it became. His hand trembled as he reached for the doorknob, pushing it open wider. The bathroom was empty, nothing out of place. The tiles were still cracked, the gaping hole in the wall still exposed, but something felt different. He could feel it in his bones. He stepped inside, the hairs on the back of his neck standing on end. The air was colder here, unnaturally so. And then he heard it again, drip, drip, drip. The noise seemed to echo from deep within the walls, louder now, more insistent. Jack's chest tightened as he scanned the room. His eyes were drawn to the open wall, to the dark space beyond the pipes and drywall. And then, as if in a trance, he crouched down, shining his flashlight into the void. At first, he saw only shadows and cobwebs, 
but as the beam of light moved deeper, it caught something. Something metallic. Jack reached in cautiously, his fingers brushing against cold metal. He pulled it out, heart racing, and stared at the object in his hand. It was an old, rusted locket. The clasp was corroded, but with a little force, Jack managed to pry it open. Inside was a small, faded photograph of a young woman. Her face was delicate, with soft eyes and dark hair. A chill ran through him as he realized he was looking at Eleanor. Suddenly, a loud crash echoed through the apartment, and Jack dropped the locket, his heart leaping into his throat. He stood up, his entire body trembling, and rushed into the hallway. The noise had come from the front door. It was wide open, swinging slightly as if someone had just walked in or out. Jack's mind reeled. He knew he had locked it. He was sure of it. He took a hesitant step toward the door, but stopped cold as a voice, a faint, whispering voice, broke the silence. Help me. The words were soft, almost indistinguishable from the wind, but Jack knew he had heard them. He spun around, searching the apartment, but there was no one there. The voice came again, closer this time, more desperate. Help me. Jack's legs felt weak. He stumbled backward, gripping the doorframe for support. His mind screamed for him to leave, to get out while he still could. But something stopped him. The voice wasn't threatening. It wasn't malicious. It was pleading. Eleanor needed his help. That night, Jack lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, wide awake. The apartment was deathly quiet, but he knew it wouldn't last. The dripping would start again soon, and when it did, he had to be ready. He had to find out what Eleanor wanted. He couldn't leave her trapped behind the walls forever. The apartment remained still, but the silence pressed down on Jack like a weight, his pulse quickening with each second that passed. The locket, Eleanor's locket, sat on his nightstand, a quiet reminder of the secret she had carried with her into death. Jack had spent hours staring at the faded photograph inside, trying to connect with the woman whose ghost now haunted his every step. What happened to you? He wondered silently. But more than that, why me? He lay in bed, his body rigid, listening for the telltale sound. It was past midnight, and the stillness of the apartment was unsettling. His ears strained for any sign of the dripping, the whisper of Eleanor's voice, the faint creaks of something moving within the walls, but the apartment remained quiet. Jack let out a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding. Maybe it was over. Maybe now that he had found the locket, Eleanor had found some peace. He almost dared to hope that this nightmare was behind him. But then, just as his eyelids began to droop, the sound returned. Drip, drip, drip. Jack shot up in bed, his heart pounding in his chest. The noise wasn't coming from the bathroom this time. It was louder, closer, as if it were coming from inside the bedroom walls. His pulse raced as the dripping grew faster, more insistent. Jack swung his legs out of bed, gripping the flashlight as he stumbled toward the source. He moved toward the wall opposite his bed, the one that faced the street. The dripping sound seemed to come from behind it, louder and more erratic than ever. Jack pressed his ear to the cold plaster, listening. The sound wasn't just water anymore, it was something thicker, more deliberate, like footsteps in shallow water. Suddenly, a faint whisper echoed from behind the wall. Help me. Please. The voice sent chills down Jack's spine, but it was unmistakable. Eleanor. She was there, right behind the wall. He could feel her presence, desperate and pleading, clawing to be heard. Jack's hand shook as he backed away from the wall. He knew what he had to do. An hour later, Jack stood in front of the wall with a hammer in one hand and a crowbar in the other. He hadn't called the police this time. They would just seal the wall again, cover up whatever was hidden there. He couldn't let that happen. Eleanor needed him, and he had to see this through. He raised the hammer and brought it down hard against the plaster. The wall cracked and dust flew into the air, but Jack didn't stop. He swung again and again, pieces of drywall crumbling away with each strike. The sound of his own hammering drowned out the dripping noise, but he could still feel Eleanor's presence pressing in on him, urging him forward. Finally, after what felt like hours, he broke through. Behind the drywall was another layer of rotted wood and brick, but, but nestled between them was a small cavity, just wide enough to hide something or someone. Jack dropped the hammer and reached inside the hole with trembling hands. His fingers brushed against something cold and metallic, and he pulled it out. It was a knife. The blade was old, rusted, but there was no mistaking it. Dried blood still clung to its edge. Jack's heart raced as he turned the knife over in his hands. 
the locket, the body, and now this. Eleanor had been murdered, and this was the weapon. A sickening realization washed over him. Someone had killed her and hidden her body in the walls of the apartment, covering up the evidence. But who and why? Before he could process it further, another sound echoed through the apartment, a faint knock, followed by the unmistakable creak of the front door opening. Jack froze, his blood running cold. He hadn't heard footsteps. He hadn't heard the door unlock, but someone or something was inside. Slowly, he turned to face the hallway, his breath coming in shallow gasps. The apartment was dimly lit by the streetlights filtering through the windows, but the hallway remained shrouded in darkness. Jack could feel a presence there, something cold and heavy watching him from the shadows. And then he saw it, a figure standing in the doorway, tall and still, its face hidden in the gloom. Jack's stomach lurched as a wave of dread crashed over him. The figure didn't move, didn't speak. It just stood there, as if waiting for him to make the first move. Eleanor? Jack whispered, though he knew it wasn't her. The figure stepped forward into the light and Jack's heart nearly stopped. It was a man. His features were sharp, gaunt, his eyes hollow and lifeless. He wore an old-fashioned suit, the kind you might see in photographs from the 1940s, and his skin had a pale, almost translucent quality to it. But it was the expression on his face that terrified Jack the most. Cold, emotionless, as if he were nothing more than a shadow. The man took another step toward him and Jack backed away, his hand tightening around the knife. What do you want? Jack demanded, his voice shaking. The man said nothing, but his gaze flicked to the knife in Jack's hand and for a brief moment, something like recognition flashed across his face. Jack's breath caught in his throat as he realized the truth. This was Eleanor's killer. The man took another step forward and Jack's mind screamed for him to run, but his feet were rooted to the spot. The figure loomed closer, his presence oppressive, suffocating. Jack could barely breathe as the man reached out a hand, pale fingers outstretched. And then, just as the man was about to touch him, a scream pierced the air, high-pitched, agonized, and unmistakably female. Eleanor! Jack shouted, spinning around toward the sound. The bathroom door was open, the lights flickering inside. The scream echoed again, louder this time, and Jack ran toward it, his heart pounding in his chest. He burst into the bathroom, his eyes darting around for any sign of her, but the room was empty. Suddenly, the lights flickered one last time and then went out, plunging the apartment into darkness. Jack stood in the doorway, gasping for breath, the knife still clutched tightly in his hand. The dripping sound had returned, louder than ever, echoing through the walls, relentless. Drip, drip, drip. And then, through the darkness, Eleanor's voice whispered once more, Help me. Jack turned toward the hole in the wall, his heart racing. It wasn't over. The darkness pressed in around Jack, thick and impenetrable, as Eleanor's voice whispered through the apartment, pleading, desperate, help me. Jack's hands trembled, the rusted knife still clenched in his grip. He couldn't think, couldn't breathe. The bathroom door creaked behind him, and the air was thick with a musty, almost decaying smell. It was as if the apartment itself was rotting from the inside out, just like Eleanor's body had behind the walls. Drip, drip, drip. The sound was everywhere now, filling the apartment like the heartbeat of something malevolent, something ancient, and it was coming closer. Jack stumbled back into the hallway, the oppressive darkness swallowing him whole. His mind raced. The killer, Eleanor's killer, had been there. He had seen him, but the man was no longer flesh and blood. He was something else now, something tied to this place, just as Eleanor was. Jack could still feel the man's icy presence lurking in the apartment, a dark shadow waiting in the corners, watching his every move. But Eleanor's voice was stronger, pulling him back to the gaping hole in the bathroom wall. This was it, the end game. He had to finish what she had started. Jack knelt in front of the exposed wall again, his flashlight flickering. The cavity where he had found the knife seemed larger now, darker, as if it stretched deeper than it should have. The dripping sound was louder here, more deliberate, and the air smelled of damp rot. He shined the flashlight inside, expecting to see nothing but old pipes and debris. But there was something else, something further back, another hidden space. Jack's pulse quickened. He reached inside, feeling around blindly. His fingers brushed against something soft and cold, and he recoiled. It felt like fabric, old and worn. Heart pounding, he forced himself to reach back in, his hands trembling. He grabbed hold of the object and slowly pulled it out. It was a dress, 
a simple white dress, yellowed with age and stained with dark reddish marks. Blood. Jack's stomach churned. This had belonged to Eleanor. It had been hidden with her all these years. As Jack held the dress in his hands, the temperature in the room plummeted. A cold gust of air swept through the apartment, rattling the windows, and Jack could feel the hairs on his arms stand on end. The man, the killer, was near. He could feel him watching, waiting. Suddenly, the bathroom door slammed shut with a deafening bang, and Jack jumped to his feet, dropping the dress. The lights flickered, and the shadows in the room seemed to stretch and writhe as if they were alive. And then, in the dim light, Jack saw her. Eleanor. She stood in the corner of the bathroom, her ghostly figure, pale and translucent, her dark hair hanging in limp strands around her face. Her eyes were wide, filled with an unbearable sadness, and her lips moved soundlessly as she stared at Jack. But it wasn't just sorrow in her gaze, it was fear. Jack's breath caught in his throat as he realized why. The figure of the man, the killer, was behind her. His tall, shadowy form loomed over her like a predator, his eyes dark and lifeless. The knife Jack had found felt heavy in his hand, and he knew without a doubt that this was the same blade that had taken Eleanor's life all those years ago. Help me, Eleanor whispered, her voice cracking with desperation. Please, Jack's mind raced. The knife, the body, the dress, the man. It was all connected, but what did Eleanor want him to do? He had uncovered the truth. He had found her killer. But she was still trapped, still tethered to this place. And the man, he wouldn't let her go. The figure of the man stepped closer to Eleanor, his face twisted into a cruel sneer, and Jack felt a surge of anger. This monster had murdered her, hidden her body, and then haunted her even in death. He couldn't let it continue. He had to stop him. He had to free her. Let her go, Jack shouted, his voice hoarse, but the man's gaze didn't waver. He stepped closer to Eleanor, his hand reaching for her throat. Jack acted on instinct. He lunged forward, the knife clutched in his hand, and stabbed at the shadowy figure. The blade sliced through the air, but there was no resistance, no flesh to meet it. The man's form wavered like smoke and Jack stumbled, falling to his knees. For a moment, everything was still. Jack's chest heaved as he looked up at Eleanor, her eyes locked on his, pleading silently. The man's shadow remained behind her, but something had shifted. The dripping had stopped, and then Jack saw it. The blood on the knife, the dried blood that had once belonged to Eleanor, was now fresh. It dripped from the blade, pooling on the floor in dark, crimson splatters. The knife, the dress, the body, they were all pieces of the same terrible puzzle. The killer had buried her, but not just behind the wall. He had buried her in time, in memory, hiding his crime where no one would ever find it. But Jack had found it. He had uncovered the truth. Jack's mind raced as he realized what he had to do. The knife wasn't just a weapon, it was the key. It was the one thing thing that connected Eleanor to her killer, to this place. And if Jack destroyed it, maybe, just maybe, he could set her free. With trembling hands, Jack raised the knife high above his head. The man's shadow seemed to ripple, growing darker, angrier. But Jack didn't hesitate. With a final desperate shout, he brought the knife down onto the floor, May shattering the blade against the tile. There was a deafening silence. For a moment, the world seemed to stop. The shadow of the man wavered, his form flickering like a dying flame. And then, with a low, guttural howl, he dissolved into nothingness, vanishing into the air as if he had never existed. Jack collapsed to the floor, his chest heaving, his body shaking with exhaustion. The room was silent now, the oppressive weight of the apartment finally lifted. He looked up, searching for Eleanor. She was still there, standing in the corner, but something had changed. Her face was no longer twisted with fear. Instead, she looked at Jack with a kind of quiet relief a peacefulness that hadn't been there before. Thank you, she whispered, her voice soft and gentle. Jack's eyes filled with tears as he watched her. Slowly, her figure began to fade, her translucent form dissolving into the air like mist in the morning sun. And then, just as quickly as she had appeared, she was gone. The apartment was still. The dripping had stopped. The darkness had lifted. It was over. Jack sat on the cold bathroom floor, his mind reeling, his body aching, the knife lay in broken pieces around him, the last remnants of a nightmare that had haunted this place for far too long. Eleanor was free, and Jack, for the first time since this ordeal began, felt free too.